Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. I'll just give a very brief um, introduction to our next speaker, speaker Dr. Jodson Brewer. Um, he received his AB degree in chemistry from Princeton University and his PhD in immunology from um, Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, short, and that was in 2004. Shortly afterwards, he received his MD, also from Washington University School of Medicine, in the medical scientist training program. And that was in 2004. He is currently assistant professor of psychiatry and, med and he's also the medical director of the Yale Therapeutic Neuroscience Clinic. Dr. Brewer's research interests complement those of Dr. Marlack quite nicely. Um, Dr. Brewer is interested in the neurobiological mechanisms underlying the interface between stress, cognitive control, and addictive processes. He studies how such processes are modulated so that we can better treat substance um, use disorders. And Dr. Brewer uses then mindfulness training to treat addictions, but he also uses a variety of neurobiological tools to measure the effectiveness of the training. And we look forward to hearing more about that. Dr. Brewer. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction. I'd first like to thank Sherry, uh, Ms. Mori, Betty Johanna, as well as Alan for um, making, for providing this opportunity for me to be here. It's really a, a wonderful pleasure. Um, to be here. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, the aims of, of this evening, I will, um, I'll try to touch bases a little bit on the neurobiology of addiction and how stress plays a role in relapse to drug use. Uh, Alan talked about this a little bit and I'll try to complement what he's been, what he's talked about. I'll then move on to talking about a few adaptations that we've made to the mindfulness-based relapse prevention program for delivery to individuals with addictions in both outpatient and inpatient settings. And finally, I'll just touch bases briefly on how we're starting to look at mindfulness training and how it's informing our understanding of how this training affects the brain and the addictive process. So just to get us all on the same page, I'll give you a brief um, definition of addiction. What is addiction? I like this definition particularly. So it's a compulsion to engage in a specific activity despite adverse consequences to the individual's health, mental state, or social life. So activity is the key here. I think there were some questions about that. Um, it can really involve um, substances, but it can also involve other behaviors as well. And we can kind of think of um, addiction as this hijacking of the neural systems. Peter Kalibas talks about this, that are normally activated by natural reward systems. And the real distinguishing feature is this power to supplant almost all other goals. You can kind of think of it as a natural assistive learning process gone awry. So where and how does addiction form in the brain? Um, I'm going to focus here on a structure called the striatum, which is involved with associative learning, associative learning um, in terms of where we learn to associate rewards with stimuli. And um, I'll go through several steps that move from the ventral or the front part of the brain um, to the dorsal or the rear part of the brain um, of, the vent of the striatum. And they involve different, uh, different structures in different circuits. So first, um, acquisition of reward happens in the limbic striatum, then moves on to um, reinforcing behavior, which uh, involves the associative striatum, and then finally moving on to more habitual responses uh, involving the sensor motor striatum. 
So we can, we can think of an example, um, hypothetical illustration. Let's say that you live in a city that is really cloudy and rainy in the winter, um, <laughs> just as an example. Um, so let's say that you have a big presentation to give the next day and you haven't finished it. You're walking down the street and you know, you're just you're dragging. You, you don't know what to do. And you walk by a Starbucks. So <laughs> you go in and you get some coffee and you, you drink the coffee and you feel revved up and you, you finish your presentation and you give a bang up job the next day. Well, the more you, you do this, you might repeat this behavior, the more you start to learn, you acquire this, um, you start to learn that, to associate this coffee with, with feeling more alert. And what you also, what, so this involves the limbic striatum. What you also might uh, not notice is that you start to associate the, uh, the mermaid with, with this feeling of feeling, um, you know, feeling perked up and, and doing what you need to do. So this involves, again, the associative striatum. But finally, when you, you, a little while later, this becomes very habitual. So you might wake up one morning <laughs> and just feel exhausted. And so, so your brain knows what to do. It says, go to Starbucks. So that's where the habit response comes in. So as you can see, um, so where does the problem come in? So imagine, habit can be really helpful. So imagine having to relearn everything that you do every day. You get up out of bed. You have to learn how to walk. You have to learn how to put on your clothes. You have to learn how to shower. You have to learn how to eat. You'd be exhausted by noon. So habit can be really helpful. It can be really helpful. So the problem occurs when it becomes so strongly automated that it becomes compulsive despite adverse consequences. So remember this, this addiction definition that we've been using. So how can we use this information to help uh, treat addictions? Well, the first, first thing to do is, is knowing where and how this happens give us a starting point to rationally affect this system. All right. So one thing that has been shown uh, to affect this process and trigger cravings is stress. So again, let's start with a definition so we're all on the same page. So a de definition that I like uh, was de developed by Selye in, in the 50s, and it's, it involves consequences of the failure to respond appropriately to emotional or physical threats to the organism, whether actual or imagined. And he actually broke this down a little bit further. So he broke it down, you can kind of think of it as good stress. Um, you stress, he described, as this good stress which, which enhances functions. You can imagine when you're, you know, you're up giving a lecture um, and it's, you know, it's revving up your system, that can really help you out a little bit. Um, but this is in contrast to distress, where you have this persistent stressor. So if I came up and gave lectures to you every night, I might be pretty exhausted by the end of the week. Um, and so these, these are not resolved through coping or adaptation. Let's use another example. So if you're driving your car down the highway and a semi suddenly merges into your lane, what you need to do is be able to respond very quickly to that stimulus. You need to be able to floor it and get out of the way. Um, and you can imagine if your car is tuned up and it's warmed up and you take good care of your car, that your car is going to be able to respond to that stimulus. But imagine if you continually drive your car that way, you're continually flooring it, you're continually slamming on the brakes, and you're not taking care of it. You don't get it tuned up. You don't change the oil. It might be much harder for your car to be able to respond to this type of a stimulus. We, as humans, are like this as well. So you can imagine if you get sleep, if you exercise, if you eat a good diet, you kind of put yourself into this eustress mode. But if you don't take care of yourself, if you work you know, really hard, you don't get enough sleep, you might slide into this distress mode um, more often. Now, the other thing to mention here is that expectations are important. So expectations are, it's kind of how we respond um, to stress based on how we've dealt with similar situations in the past. So it, sounds, it might sound a bit like habit. The more we do something, the more likely we are to do that in the future. Um, so let's go back to an, a scenario. Let's say that you go to Starbucks and you order a latte. You take a sip and it's orange juice, or it's freezing cold, or it's not the way you like it prepared. I'm not sure that anybody can relate to that. Um, so what happens? You might, if you're in use stress mode, you might go up to the counter and say, you know, somebody made a steak, this is orange juice, I ordered the latte with the with whatever and whatever. Um, and you know, say and be very polite about it and then get it resolved. If you've had a bad day or you're, you're in distress mode, you might go in and rip their head off. This is over orange juice. 
Um, so these expectations can play a, a huge role um, in, in these situations. Really the same stimulus, this orange juice, can tip us in one direction or another depending on where we're sitting at the time, eustress or distress. So how you take care of your car is very, very important. And you can imagine keeping ourselves in eustress mode could be very helpful in dealing with different types of stressors. So how do we measure stress in the lab? Um, Rajitasan at Yale University has actually uh, developed a really nice paradigm which involves people recounting a very stressful situation in the past year. And this is standardized and um, played back to the individuals over headphones. Um, we, we can normalize these scripts for body sensations, emotions, and thoughts that build throughout the story. And she's shown nicely, and I'll show you some of her data, that um, this has been shown to increase anxiety and induce drug craving. So I'll give you a, a brief example of a script. This is a lot of words, so I'll go through it quickly. So this is an actual script that we developed with one of our subjects. Uh, you're walking up to your apartment. You notice an ambulance out front with its lights flashing. Your heart beats faster. Oh, no, I hope this ain't my wife, you think. You tense the muscles in your face and forehead. You walk quickly inside and see the paramedics coming out the front door with Pam on a stretcher. Your face flushes. What happened, you ask? The paramedics don't say anything to you and keep moving. You clench your fists. What's, go what's wrong with my wife, you say louder. Your stomach's in a knot. You see the cops looking at you. We've got to ask you some questions, one of them says. You tense the muscles in your back and shoulders. You, I, I need to go to the hospital with my wife, you yell. Your heart's pounding. The big cop grabs you and takes you inside the house. You see him pull on the cuffs, pull out the cuffs. You tense the muscles all over your body. I have to go to the hospital, you scream, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these scripts are really, they build throughout time, and we can standardize them. And you can see they can be very, very powerful for people. So before I, I show you some data with what, look, what, the, what happens in the brain with these types of scripts, I'll just give you a quick primer on, on the types of sections that we're going to look at for those that aren't used to looking at, at MRI images. So you can kind of think of this in, in a couple of different ways, the different sections that I'll show you. So if you take an ax and split your head down the middle, that's called a sagittal section, and that's what it kind of looks like. If you cut it um, uh, along the crown of your head, those are coronal sections, and those look like this. And if you kind of cut it in a horizontal plane, those are axial or transverse sections. So I'll be showing mostly coronal and axial or transverse sections in this talk. But you can kind of use those, the, these as a reference point for the types of brain images that I'll be showing you. So how do we actually measure brain activity? Um, this is a transverse section. Uh, we, one of the tools that we can use is functional magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. And this is an, it's an indirect measure of, of brain activation. And using the level of oxygenation and hemoglobin, we can actually, uh, which is proportional to brain activity, we can start to look to see what's act relatively activated and what's not. So what I'll be showing you throughout the talk is in red, when you see red blobs or yellow blobs, this is relative activation. And when you see blue or purple, this is relative deactivation. So kind of keep that in mind. Relative activation and relative deactivation uh, in the brain that we can look at in, in humans. So this has a couple of advantages. It has excellent spatial resolution. We can actually look at any part in the brain within a few millimeters. Um, it has decent temporal resolution, so we can look at, in an order of seconds on, on the brain responses. And you can do some mathematical tricks to actually hone that down a little bit. Um, so this is a really nice tool that we can use in, in alive humans that um, that's, ha, poses relatively low risk and can give us a lot of information. So now moving back to stress, what happens in the brain during stress? So this is, this is a study that Regita did uh, that she published back in 2004. And if you look at healthy volunteers and you give them these stress strip, scripts, one similar to what I showed you, you actually see a deactivation in the, in the part of the brain that's involved with cognitive control. So this is a coronal section where we're looking at the prefrontal cortex, specifically the anterior cingulate cortex, or the ACC. And what she actually found was that the more stressed people report, the lower the activation in this area. So the more this part of the brain actually goes offline. The, I won't show you the data here, but um, the other thing that she found was that the habit mode kicks in. So you get deactivation in the prefrontal cortex, the part involved with cognitive control, and you get activation in the habit mode. Um, so you can kind of think about this in terms of how you might have reacted to someone who's asked you for something when you've been tired or angry. You might slip into your habit mode, whether it's mm, no or ask me later or however you respond when you're tired. 
um, as compared to when you're when you're in use stress mode or you're in you're doing well and you might be more um, you might you might be more responsive to their their queries. So what happens with people with uh, cocaine dependence? So in individuals with cocaine dependence, Regina found something very interesting. So she found that in the part of the brain that's involved in habit, so the dorsal striatum, you actually, you actually get activation. So this is the dorsal striatum here. And the interesting part that she found was, so if you look at the y-axis here, this is stress-induced craving. This is self-reported craving. The more that people report craving, the more this part of the dorsal striatum or the, the habit part of the brain activates. So again, this suggests that, the, that these two are intimately linked. So the more people get stressed out, the more they go into habit mode. And so what happens with people with addictions, they might have used coping mechanisms such as using drugs or alcohol in the past, and so it activates this habit mode um, so, so, such that they start craving when they get stressed out. This gives us a target to go after. So what about stress and addiction? I'm not going to go, there's a lot of literature now in, in the recent years that's been, that bears this out as well. I'll just go through a few of the highlights. So one is that acute stress leads to increased uh, self-administration of drugs, such as stimulants, amphetamine, cocaine, and alcohol. Um, stress, as I showed you with the previous slide, um, actually induces drug craving and consumption. Um, what about stress and relapse? I will, I'll just go through this quickly because Dr. Marlatt um, really covered this nicely. So stressful events and psychological distress are frequently cited re reasons for relapse to drug use. And importantly, relapse has been attributed to negative emotion or interpersonal stress. And actually, the more intense the negative affect prior to relapse, the longer the duration of relapse. So these are really tightly connected. So what's the Buddha's take on all of this? Um, so it, you, some of you might have heard of, of, um, one of one of the many lists that the Buddha had, which, was called, which is the Four Noble Truths. And you can kind of sum it up this way. So that our lives are unsatisfactory. Um, so Alan talked about uh, dukkha. Our lives are unsatisfactory. We actually add to this unsatisfactoriness through attachment. We can actually stop doing this to ourselves, and we can stop doing it by following what the Buddha described as the middle way. Um, which is three pillars, so morality, wisdom, and then mastery of one owns mind, one's own mind. And I'll talk about this middle pillar uh, in terms of mindfulness um, now. So how do we translate in, that into real life? So again, going back to um, uh, the sensory information, so this starts with our interaction with the world. So we get sensory information coming into the brain. The brain, um, these events come into contact with our consciousness. This provides what the Buddhists describe as a feeling tone. So this can either be pleasant or unpleasant or even neutral. And with the pleasant, we want more. And with the unpleasant, we want less of it. So that's, that's um, basically what happens. So where does stress come in here? So you can go back to this you stress or if you're having a good day. If you're working in use stress mode, that orange juice is not a big deal. You give, take it back to the counter, you, know, you ask for your latte the way you like it. Um, if it's a bad day, you might rip that person's head off. So what's going on? So if you remember, these expectations um, really can color our consciousness. Um, so these previous experiences play a, a really essential role. So we expect the world to be a certain way. And when we don't have the resources to cope, we freak out. So what can we do about this? Well, there are a couple of things you can do. One is you can make the world conform to your expectations. Good luck. <laughs> um, or you can make sure that you have the resources to cope. And one way to, to learn to cope is through mindfulness. So an overview of mindfulness. Um, Alan gave a, a really nice definition that John Kabat-Zinn uses. I'm going to give another one that's, um, that was developed at a research uh, consensus conference and published back in 2004. It involves two components. One is a self-regulation of attention, so that's maintained on the immediate experience. The second is adopting a particular orientation characterized by curiosity, openness, and acceptance. So attention and acceptance. Um, so many of you here might have, have done different types of meditations. Those that haven't, why don't we just, all of us try this for one second here. So if you can, you can just take your hands and put them together like this. And you can just look, just look at them, just notice them.
Okay, congratulations. You, you all just practiced mindfulness. So <laughs> what you might have noticed there is as you were sitting there, thoughts might have come up like, am I doing this correctly? Or why am I sitting here putting my hands together when I could be having a latte at Starbucks? <laughs> um, so mindfulness is simple. It's simple to do. It's simply paying attention in the present moment, accepting whatever's coming up. The, the part that's a little more difficult is stringing these moments of mindfulness together. <laughs> so how do we measure mindfulness? Um, we were very excited about uh, looking into this um, and formed a general hypothesis in addictions that mindfulness training might modulate the degree to which people compulsively or habitually react to stress. Again, remember that's a leading uh, cause of relapse and other triggers of this modulating drug use. And one part, one reason we were excited about this is that you can actually test this in a laboratory setting and you can also follow drug use in daily life so you can look at outcomes. So we, we developed one pilot study a couple of years ago and the first question we asked was um, can, we, can we adapt this to be a little more clinically viable in our patient population settings? So typically, at, at least at, um, at Yale, there, there are settings in the community where there are few trained therapists and um, they're rolling admissions. So people want to, they don't want to make people wait. So we, we worked on adapting this a little bit more for those types of settings. The other thing we asked was, is it well tolerated? So at the time that we started these studies, um, the first study that Alan described with the Vipassana meditators in prison populations had just been published. Very few studies were actually out on whether people with addictions would even tolerate this type of treatment. So we, we wanted to ask that basic question as well. We also wanted to ask if they actually learn mindfulness skills and use them. And how does it compare to certain gold standard treatments? So Alan talked about one gold standard treatment, relapse prevention. I'm going to talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a staple um, in, in New Haven. Um, and finally, does mindfulness training affect physiologic responses to stress? So the study was relatively simple. We just looked for about 20 uh, completers. We cast a broad net. We looked for people that had alcohol or cocaine dependence or abuse in the past year. And these folks were randomized to receive mindfulness training or manualized cognitive behavioral therapy at our substance abuse treatment unit uh, at Yale. And they received these trainings for 9 to 12 weeks. So the first hypothesis that we asked was, or that we hypothesized with the, was that mindfulness would be tolerated. Um, the second one was that it would modulate responses to stress and that it would normalize altered physiologic responses uh, to personalized stress induction using the stress induction methodology that I mentioned earlier. So before I go on, um, I should mention buyer beware um, because this is a pilot study. It's small. It, we only, basically only analyzed completers. There were heterogeneous uh, substance use populations. It was at a single site. So keeping that in mind, um, this, is, this is the consort diagram uh, in terms of the folks that were eligible and randomized. We had 30 people, 36 that were assessed. We randomized all 36. 15 were randomly assigned to cognitive behavioral therapy. 21 were randomly assigned to mindfulness training. We had five completers and nine completers in, in the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and the mindfulness training group. And then most of those folks went on to complete our lab sessions. This is actually pretty typical. So the typical completion rate of an outpatient substance uh, treatment, substance abuse treatment is, can range from 5 to 30 percent. So these rates were actually pretty good. So this is 30 and about 40 percent. So I'm going to go through this quickly because Alan mentioned, um, talked about this in more detail. Mindfulness-based relapse prevention is based on um, mindfulness-based stress reduction that uh, John Kabat-Zinn developed. Teaches different ways to use mindfulness to work with thoughts, emotions, and body sensations that trigger and foster drug use. Um, it's typically delivered in eight sessions using a psychoeducation format. Oops. So sample sessions, um, again, different sessions can involve talking about autopilot, seeing thoughts as thoughts, urge surfing, balancing acceptance and change. And uh, so I'll just walk through one quickly. So the concept might be autopilot. We would talk with them about um, how we operate on autopilot, habitually going through our days. In, in that habit mode, we're unaware of the body, emotions, and thoughts, and these triggers can lead to habitually doing things, so triggered as in using drugs. And awareness can help us step out of this habit mode and respond rather than react to the environment. If you remember the sober breathing space, that respond rather than react is really key. 
And the, the core is that mindfulness training helps foster this awareness of the body, the emotions, and thoughts, helping us retra uh, retrain to see that we don't have to believe everything we think. So our sessions were typically a bit shorter um, than the ones that Alan described. So a sample session might go through a body scan for a few minutes, review homework, introduce a new concept or a topic, practice a skill, and then assign homework. Now this is in contrast to cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, again, one of the empirically derived treatments or, um, where they talk about cravings in very similar ways to I think what Alan's described in the way that we look at it as well. So craving can be strongest early on. They can be triggered by cues. They're time limited like a wave. Um, and drug use increases cravings. So the skills that people learn are to avoid triggers. They, can, they learn distracting activities. They learn ways to talk it through, to urge surf, and then challenge and change thoughts. So what's the difference between these two? So again, we go through experience. It interacts with the, with the consciousness. We have this feeling tone. And these feeling tones, so if it's pleasant, we want more, and this can lead to craving. If it's unpleasant, actually, we can, this can lead to a craving as well. Remember those coping mechanisms that people use. Now, involved here are thoughts, emotions, and body sensations. So these, these feelings can lead, these feeling tones can lead to thoughts and emotions, which can lead to cravings. And also, cravings can lead to more thoughts and more emotions, which then perpetuate this cycle. All of these leading to a behavior, and in this case, drug use. So what does cognitive behavioral therapy target in this, in this cycle? So again, avoiding sensory stimuli, so people, places, and things is often talked about. Um, they also talk about changing thoughts. Um, that's very different than what mindfulness focuses on. It focuses on becoming aware of thoughts um, and emotions and recognizing them just as phenomena. So these phenomena happen, and if we can just recognize them and accept them um, as just phenomena rather than something that must be acted upon, this can lead to decreased automaticity in behavior. So with this as a background, the first question we asked was, could we adapt this? Um, so the first thing we did was we removed the yoga component. Yoga has been shown preliminarily to have some effects on drug use and outcomes. So we didn't want that to confound our data, and we just removed that component from the treatment. We also added an anger module as a, a model uh, emotion to work with. Typically, anger is a big problem for people with addictions. And we also, as part of that, as the antidote to that, we added what's called metta, or loving kindness, which is more of, an, um, of a compassion-based practice. Again, our sessions were a bit shorter than the ones that are typically delivered. And we also delivered these in two blocks. If you remember, typically, typical clinics have these rolling admission processes. We wanted to have people be able to get in within a couple of weeks of coming to us for treatment. So typically, someone could receive a, an introductory session. They would go into block one, which would be derived of four sessions. Then they would go to block two. Or they could be, get the in, same introduction and go to block two and then block one. Um, and then in our case, they both got a laboratory session. So the first question that we asked, is mindfulness well tolerated? Uh, we looked at a treatment credibility score that we uh, scale that we developed. Um, typical questions would be, are you confident that this would help you with drug use, depression, or anxiety? Does it make sense? Uh, and would you recommend this to a friend? And as you can see, so this was on a five-point Likert scale, one being I hated this, five being it was the best thing on earth. Um, Everybody rated this close to the best thing on earth. Um, it was 4.2 4 in the mindfulness training and 4.4 in the cognitive behavioral therapy group. So really no differences between these groups in terms of how much they like these. So the second question we asked was, do they develop skills? Um, and, and Alan briefly mentioned this, the five-facet mindfulness questionnaire. It's a self-reported questionnaire of mindfulness skills. Um, if you look, so mindfulness training is in the dark bars here. Cognitive behavioral therapy is in the light bars. This is pre-treatment and post-treatment. If you look pre-treatment, there's really no difference between the groups. If you look post-treatment, there's no difference statistically between the groups, but you can see a greater a trend toward uh, in, increased mindfulness acquisition in the mindfulness training group. You would actually expect skills to go up in both groups because of such of the overlap between mindfulness training and cognitive behavioral therapy. So everything, we saw an increase in cognitive behavioral therapy as well as mindfulness training, but a little bit more in mindfulness training. So 
how does it compare to cognitive behavioral therapy for relapse prevention? I'm not going to show you the data for lack of time, but really the bottom line is there was no difference between groups in drug or alcohol use. This is actually very encouraging to us because cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be one of the gold standards, and this seemed comparable in drug use outcomes. One thing that we did see that was different was that folks tended to attend sessions more in the mindfulness training group than the cognitive behavioral therapy. So again, mindfulness training is in the dark, and cognitive behavioral therapy is in the light. If you look on the y-axis, you see treatment retention. So this is measured in percent of sessions attended. We got about 65% uh, attendance rate in the mindfulness training, and about half that, about 33% in the cognitive behavioral therapy, suggesting that these folks felt that they were getting something out of this. And this has actually been associated with outcomes. What about physiologic responses to stress? I'm just going to walk you quickly through um, a sample paradigm of when we pe bring people into the lab, what they would expect with the stress paradigm. So say they would arrive at 3 PM. They would get hooked up to our equipment. They get randomized to one of the cues, so a stress versus a neutral imagery condition. They would have a baseline period where we would me measure baseline physiologic um, activity. They would do um, self-reported ratings of craving, anxiety, and emotions. Then they would go through an imagery period for five minutes, and then they would um, rate their cravings, anxiety, and emotions. After that, they'd go through a recovery period, which included a guided relaxation to really get them back to a baseline, and then go through the same thing again with the, with the next story. This is what it looks like in the lab. Um, they sit in a comfortable chair. They listen to the story over headphones. And they're hooked up to an uh, ECG machine, as well as a respiratory rate monitor and skin conductance. You can see here next to the person is a laptop. And this is where they are cued to answer uh, all these types of self-report questions. This is what it looks like from the experimenter side. So they're um, separated by a partition. There's really no interaction between the two. And then they can measure these responses as well as, the, as well as the paradigm. The measures that we looked at, we looked at galvanic skin response. This is crudely can be looked at as emotional reactivity or a startle response. If you've ever been in a room and the door slams behind you suddenly and your skin breaks out into a sweat, you, you've, congratulations, you've just had a great galvanic skin response. That's kind of what, what we look at here. Um, we also look at heart rate variability, which I'll talk about more in detail in a few slides which looks at the sympathetic and parasympathetic tone of the autonomic nervous system. We also looked at respiratory rate and self-reported measures such as craving, anxiety, uh, et cetera. So this is what a typical tracing looks like. On the top, you can see uh, the galvanic skin response, respiratory rate, and then we can look at heart rate and heart rate variability. This is in a neutral story. So keep in mind what the galvanic skin response looks like here. So with a stress story, it's strikingly different. You can see that there are a number of galvanic skin responses. Their respiratory rate goes up, and their heart rate changes quite a bit as well. So these, again, these stress stories are, are very stressful. So what happens to individuals that receive mindfulness training versus cognitive behavioral therapy? Again, the mindfulness training is in the dark bars. The cognitive behavioral therapy is in the light bars. This is self-reported anxiety on the y-axis. So the, more, the higher up, the more anxiety they report. If you look at the neutral story first on the left side, you can see that there's really no difference between groups. That's what we'd expect. They, they report low anxiety with these stories. But if you go to a stressful story, and these, these um, asterisks denote uh, statistically significant differences, that the people in my, that received mindfulness training reported significantly less anxiety um, with the stressful story compared to cognitive behavioral therapy. And then if you normalize it for the neutral story, there's even a larger difference. This was also supported when we looked at a number of other emotions using the differential emotion scale. Again, on the y-axis, the higher up is, is, more, um, is more affect. And if you look on the x-axis, axis, we looked at emotions such as anxiety, sadness, anger, and fear. All of these were significantly attenuated in the mindfulness training group, again, in the dark bars. Um, and there was even an attenuation and decrease of positive emotions, so looking at relaxation and joy. Um, with mindfulness training, it seems to really attenuate these responses. What about um, drug craving? So if you remember, p negative affect goes with uh, drug craving. And we've found the same thing. These were not statistically significantly different. You can see there's a lot of variability here. But on the y-axis, they reported drug craving. And in the dark bars, the mindfulness training group actually reported about half the craving that the people in the cognitive behavioral therapy reported. This is a really striking finding for us because this may suggest that we may be getting at, at stress as a mechanism for, uh, for drug relapse and craving.
where with mindfulness training as compared to cognitive behavioral therapy. So what about physiologic responses? So these, I talked, these are all psychological responses that I talked about. And now let's move into physiology. So this was maximum heart rate on the y-axis. Um, if you look at the neutral story, there was really no difference between the groups. Um, but if you looked at the stress story, the cognitive behavioral therapy group in the light bars went up, as you would expect. When you get stressed out, your heart rate goes up. But surprisingly, there was really no difference between the stories with the mindfulness training group. Now, this was not statistically significantly different, but it, given in this pilot study, this, these are partial eta squared um, effect sizes. An effect size greater than 0.14 is considered large. So this was a large effect size, um, which was pretty encouraging. So let me move on to heart rate variability. This is the last physiologic measure that we looked at. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background for those that aren't familiar with it. So the heart receives input from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. Um, in healthy individuals, the heart is under tonic parasympathetic inhibitory control. That's a mouthful. So you can, let's go back to our car. You're, you're driving your car and your car is tuned up. Um, this facilitates adaptive responses to environmental stimuli. So remember, you need to floor it. And this, this is exactly what happens when you're in, in eustress mode. So you can react, you can respond within an, on a time scale of, in an order of milliseconds. This is very different in your, if you're in distress mode or if you haven't kept your car tuned up, where if you're, if sympath if you're uh, tonically overdriven by your sympathetic effects, you can only respond in an order of uh, magnitude of seconds. So this has actually been shown to be a heart rate variability has been shown to be a reliable index of this balance between the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And it's actually been associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality. So more, the more the sympathetic overdrive, the more likely you are to die in general <laughs> um, by a number of different ways. And this is just math for those that care. Um, you, it's calculated by measuring the power spectral density of the low um, as a measure of the sympathetic and the high frequency, which is a measure of the vagal or the parasympathetic bands. So what did we find? Um, so if you look at the sympathetic to parasympathetic or vagal ratio on the y-axis, this is with the stress minus the neutral story. In the mindfulness training, we actually saw a decrease in the sympathetic overdrive. So people were behaving more in the eustress mode. With cognitive behavioral therapy, it would be as you would expect that these, this uh, sympathetic overdrive took over a bit. This is actually a very large effect size um, with large um, significance as well. So just to summarize with all of this, it seems that mindfulness training was tolerable. Um, it seems that there was efficacy between, um, compared to cognitive behavioral therapy. There was a trend toward increase in mindfulness skills. And physiologically and psychologically, we saw decreased emotional reactivity during stress. We saw decreased heart rate. This was just a trend. And we saw decreased sympathetic tone during stress. So where, where do we go next? Um, so stress craving in the brain. So these are, I showed you a lot of physiologic data. We can now start to look in the brain and say, see what's actually going on in the brain during stress. And as I pointed out earlier, Rajita's already mapped out a lot of this stuff in, in people with addictions. So we're actually, we have an ongoing study in collaboration with, with Rajita Sinha um, looking at mindfulness training in cocaine-dependent individuals. We have a, a clinical neuroscience research unit where we can bring people in on a voluntary basis to learn mindfulness training for a month at a time. Um, so this is, they're away from all of their triggers, they're away from all of their usual stuff. And then we can measure their brain activation with stress imagery. So we can do these fMRI paradigms using the stress imagery um, protocol that I, I mentioned earlier. The other uh, study that we're moving on to is looking at smoking cessation. And again, we can tr give people one month of outpatient mindfulness training. We can look at their brain activation with stress imagery. And we can also look at outcomes. We can look at cessation and relapse prevention. I'll just talk a little bit more about the smoking cessation trial. Um, we're randomizing a large number of individuals so that we can look, really look at outcomes effectively. And we're randomizing them to mindfulness training or a group smoking cessation therapy, which was developed by the American Lung Association. This has been shown to have pretty good um, uh, cessation rates. And again, subjects receive eight sessions of mindfulness training. Again, this would be twi twice weekly. And our primary outcomes that we're looking at are smoking cessation as well as brain activation during personalized stress. 
So with that, I'm going to move on to the last part of my talk in terms of where we're going even more from here. So one area of, of research that we've been very interested in is real-time fMRI. Um, and this is very early in, in the development of real-time fMRI. It's actually only been around for about four years. It was one of the first development um, sites was at Stanford. Uh, Christopher Descharmes and his colleagues started working this out. And it's really, they can deliver feedback of specific brain regional activation with only a two second delay. And this is feedbacks delivered via visual input. I'll show you uh, what that looks like. And you can kind of think of this as, um, so you think of biofeedback, which has been very popular, um, it, not as popular now as it was 20 years ago. But with biofeedback, you might get a blood pressure cuff if you're trying to regulate your blood pressure. Um, and then you, that's attached to some type of auditory feedback. So a tone might increase in pitch if you're able to decrease your blood pressure. And basically, they give you the cuff, and they give you the speaker, and they say, go for it. And you play around empirically and try to figure out ways of getting this largely um, non, um, this non-conscious process into conscious control. So... Is, is this is real-time feedback, is real-time fMRI just um, fancy biofeedback? One difference is that we can actually be very specific. So these were empirically derived in terms of blood pressure. Um, we can now be a little more specific than previous modes of biofeedback, looking at specific brain regions. And this has actually been shown to have some preliminary efficacy in pain control. Um, it was published a couple of years ago. So what does this look like? Um, in their paradigm, and this is actually just south of, of San Francisco is where, where they do their work. So typical California fashion, I guess, it's a bonfire. Um, and what you, you see the bonfire is your main visual feedback. But you also see, um, as shown by this red circle, in, on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is activation or deactivation. So you can see here, some below the, the uh, y-axis is deactivation, and then you get activation. So people can get a sense of how they're doing over time. And what this looks like is with high activation, the bonfire goes up, and with low activation, the bonfire goes down. So what about real-time fMRI for meditation? So current techniques that people use for meditation training well, let me back up. Current techniques have individuals develop their own strategies for changing brain activation. So Christopher Descharmes' group is, is using having people derive their own ways of activating certain parts of the brain. These are empirically derived and, as you can imagine, can be time consuming. What about meditation techniques? Well, these have been standardized for a, a, over 3,000 years. They are based, and how do people know whether they're doing this correctly? This is a really interesting question in the field, and I don't have a good answer for this. But typically what people get is they get feedback from teachers. They get verbal feedback. They'll tell the teacher what they're doing, what they're experiencing. The teacher will give them feedback and say, try this or try this. And it's, it's difficult to gauge the correctness of the technique. It's a very iterative process. So the, the question is, can we combine neurofeedback with meditation? Can we help people learn techniques, quote unquote, correctly at the beginning? Um, the analogy that I'd use is if anybody's practiced yoga, you might do a yoga pose like downward facing dog. And you can do downward facing dog every day of the week, and you can think you're doing a great job. You might go to yoga class, and your teacher says, oh, why don't you shift your hips this way or drop your shoulders? And all of a sudden, you feel like the pose is completely different for you. Now, your teacher's not doing the pose for you. They're just giving you some suggestions as to how, how you might improve that technique. That can, that can move your, um, your progress tr forward at a really rapid pace, whereas if you just kept doing the same thing over and over and over, you would develop that habit, perhaps a bad one. So the question is, can we help people learn these techniques correctly using um, feedback from certain parts of the brain? And the second question we can ask then is, does neurofeedback help with cra craving regulation or smoking cessation using these techniques? So the first step that we're starting to develop is um, to really determine what brain regions are activated during meditation so we can then give people feedback um, during meditation so that they, they might learn what might be a, a quote-unquote correct or incorrect way to do this. Um, the, so with this, we have to develop regions of interest or ROIs. We're doing this by uh, recruiting expert meditators using a single uh, meditation tradition. As you know, there are lots of meditation traditions out there doing different types of meditation. We thought it would be nice 
to start with one single one so we could really try to get it standardized. And this is actually the one, as, as uh, Alan mentioned, is that MBSR and a lot of the mindfulness-based treatments are, are derived from. We asked people, uh, we only re are recruiting folks that have 5,000 or more hours of experience. Just to put this in perspective, an entire year is about 8,000 plus hours. So these folks, if you add up all their experience together, they've been meditating a total of over half a year um, nonstop. Um, we had them do three different meditation techniques. And then we really tried to match uh, controls for age, education, sex, race, even interest in meditation so that we could really have a good control group to see um, where we're headed. Because you can imagine this, this stage of the process is really critical. Um, and then we could use these regions of interest to test real-time fMRI in range of individuals. We can then go back and give novices feedback. We can give people with moderate experience, so zero, between zero and 5,000 hours, and then those with greater than 5,000 hours, and see how well they do with this feedback. Um, I'm just going to give you just some, a teaser in terms of our, our first look at the data, um, because we, this is, we're about halfway through this first study. So if you, if you take a composite of novice and advanced meditators, so this is just 10 individuals, a very small sample size, and you have them do different uh, meditation techniques. So this one is concentration, for example, where you're just asking people to pay attention to the breath. And if they notice that the mind wanders, bring your attention back to the breath. Um, another meditation that we had them do was choiceless awareness, where their object of meditation was whatever came into the awareness. Just use that as your object, and then notice whatever comes up next. As you can see, there are some, a lot of similarities between these two, um, these two meditations. And you can see a bunch of regions that are activated and then some that are deactivated. Um, the, the third one that we looked at was this loving kindness meditation, which has a slightly different focus, where you use phrases of your choosing. And it's, it's very similar to prayer, where you're res wishing people well. So you might use a phrase, may all beings be happy, may all beings be healthy, may all beings be free from inner and outer harm, whatever phrases that, that uh, speak to you. And if you notice, there are similar regions of deactivation, but very different um, regions of activation. I'm not going to speculate on any of this stuff yet, because this, uh, what this tells us is that sim uh, meditations with a similar focus um, may have regions of the brain that activate similarly. This is encouraging, because these, these might be real regions of interest to go after. And they also have some, seem to have some similarity between these and other types of meditation, such as loving kindness, but not complete overlap. So we can kind of think of this as our main effect. And um, the loving kindness perhaps is a positive control for meditation for other active processes. So what's the bottom line? Um, I, I showed you a lot of different things tonight. I'll sum it up. It's funny how you can sum up your entire career in three sentences. <laughs> so one. <laughs> Mindfulness training may be useful with addictions. That's the data that I showed you with our pilot study, which is very encouraging, needs to be followed up. Um, it may actually target stress, which is, uh, I hope that you all got a sense for how intric intricately connected stress and craving and relapse is. So this might be a, a different type of treatment that we can use to actually go after something that's really important for relapse prevention. Um, also, fMRI may be helpful in understanding where mindfulness training works. Those are the last slides that I showed you. We're, we're starting to get preliminary evidence for that. And we hope that this may help us improve our treatments of addiction. So we can then take this knowledge that we learned from expert meditators and then apply it to people with addictions. So with that, I will um, stop and thank a, a number of individuals, namely our subjects. So without people that volunteer for these studies, we wouldn't have any data. So they're the most important. I had a great team that I worked with, um, Bruce Roundsville, Kathy Carroll, as well as Mark Batenza with the fMRI work. Regita Sinha's group was very helpful with the stress paradigm. Um, we have a great magnetic resonance imaging facility. Todd Constable runs that group. Um, we had some great collaborators here at University of Washington. I'll especially um, thank Sarah Bowen and Nehak Chawla, who were really instrumental in helping us with the adaptations. Um, with some great psychologists at uh, Yale, Jeremy Gray and his group. And then finally, none of this is free. So most of our funding was through NIDA. Um, we got a little funding through the Mind and Life Institute, as well as the Yale Center for Clinical Investigation. So with that, I'll stop. And thank you for listening and take any questions.
was wondering when you were testing your subjects uh, with the stories, whether they were told to utilize um, mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. or whether they had just already incorporated it into the way they respond naturally. Right, it's a great question. I should have clarified that during the session. We didn't prompt them with, okay, now use the skills that you learned. We just had them hook up. We told them what, what would happen in terms of the scenarios, but then we just let them roll. So it was, it was actually very encouraging to see these effects even without prompting them or encouraging them to use skills that they use. It's a great question. I was just wondering if uh, American culture in general is very unmindful. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I think, I think yes, and uh, I, I kind of what popped into my head was I was wondering if there's been any inquiry or any studies in kind of the effect of technology on the type of unmindfulness that seems to manifest culturally, and if technology, whether it be cell phones, Palm Pilots, television, internet, whatever is really deactivating uh, certain parts of the brain and causing a lot of unmindfulness. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So as part of as part of mindfulness. So if you guys remember stringing these moments of mindfulness together, you can think of um, of technology as trying to grab our attention, and it does it very different ways and tries to it, our attention spans of actually. I think I don't know these these literature very well, but I'm sure y'all could talk about it better than I could. But our attention spans have actually decreased. So if you use that kind of as a surrogate for unmindfulness, then the answer might be yes, um, that we become more unmindful because we have all these things trying to get our attention. If you go to any website, there's going to be something blinking on that website trying to get your attention when you're trying to direct your attention toward the text. That too can, you know, in the, the, it suggests that because all websites have these, that this is probably successful. <laughs> So that, that I would I would argue that this that that suggests that we are you know at least our our advertising communities try to be try to grab our attention and that pulls us in so many different directions leading to a, a real difficulty in staying focused on a certain topic. So uh, there's a, you know I'm not sure if people have actually studied that, but I would you know it seems that that's that's the trend. Okay, thanks. Sure. That's sort of interesting. That reminds me of. Um, kids, and I have teenage children uh, who are into the high tech and, and such, and I worry a little bit about their uh, attention and so on. So that leads me to the question of what is mindfulness like uh, during development hmm. and um, in, in terms of, and can it be trained? <laughs> during development? During, especially, yeah, adolescence especially. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. and. Not my, not my area of, of research, but there are, certain, there are a lot of people now looking at mindfulness, teaching mindfulness as early as elementary school. Okay. Um, certainly, there are lots of people that are starting to look at it in adolescence as well. Mm -hmm. um, I won't even speculate as to whether, you know, whether that might work. But one thing that, that children certainly have that we get in the habit of not doing is they have more of an acceptance-based mode of, of living. So they are kind of naturally mindful until they kind of learn not to be. So they're inquisitive, they go and they explore their world, they do all, of, all sorts of different uh, exploratory behavior. And then they learn you know, through feedback, oh, this is good, this is bad. And then they start to c kind of box themselves in as they become, a, and then we become very small mm -hmm. as adults and, mm -hmm. and we, it's really difficult. So I would say if you can kind of and train that early on, mm -hmm. that might be a great way to help them continue that habit of being throughout adolescence and adulthood. And especially in adolescence where there's a lot of pruning that happens in the brain, there's a lot of development that happens, mm -hmm. you know, the limbic system, the prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex, all mm -hmm. of these types of things. It could be a, it could be a really great mode um, to look at in terms mm -hmm. of long-term change. So that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Is there, um, is there one, do we have time for one yeah. more? One more. Okay, okay, this will have to be the last one. one okay, thank you. Um, seeing that cognitive behavioral therapy works fairly well with addictive um, personalities or people who have addictions, but doesn't work well at all for eating disorders, especially like anorexia and bulimia, would you expect uh, mindfulness therapy to work better with eating disorders? or? Yeah, What'd it's a think? good question. I, again, I can only speculate because I, I, there are only preliminary data suggestive. So um, Jean Christeller's work at Indiana State, there's somebody at, 
I think, in New Mexico that's also studying where they have some very positive effects with, with um, actually, this is with people with obesity. So I'm, I, it suggests that that might be a different mode of, of looking at things, so perhaps more, um, you know, more helpful. But again, the data, I, I'd wait for the data to see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think with that we'll have to conclude.